Let's go to the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4, and let's read verses 7 through 10. <clears throat> and in the days of Artaxerxes, wrote Bishlam, Midradath, Tabiel, and the rest of their companions unto Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the writing of the letter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. And Rehum, the chancellor, and Shimshai the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king of this sort, the king in this sort. Uh, then wrote Rehum the chancellor and Shimshai the scribe and the rest of their companions, the Deniites and the Pharsachites, the Tarpalites and the Pharsites, and the Archivites and the, and the Babylonians, the Susankites, the Dehavites, and the Elamites, and the rest of the nations, whom the great and noble Asnapper, um, or Asnapper, brought over and set in the cities of Samaria, and the rest that are on this side the river, and at such a time. <coughs> Excuse me. We left off with verse 6 last time. Notice verses 6 and 7 mention two separate kings, uh, Ahasuerus, then Artaxerxes. The one followed the other as king of Persia during this time. Verse 7 also says the letter they wrote to Artaxerxes was written in the Syrian tongue. That's what you would, I guess, call Syriac. Um, this is the third language um, used in the Bible. The Bible is often thought to only have been written in Hebrew and Greek, but not so. Um, from Daniel... 2 verse 4 until Daniel 8 verse 1, everything in those chapters was written also in Syriac. Uh, that's commonly referred to as Aramaic. You may hear some people say Aramaic. That was the language Jesus uh, spoke when he made Simon Peter the first pope. That's what Catholics say. But um, it was sort of a hybrid Semitic tongue uh, similar to Hebrew but widely used among the um, Semitic nations around this world. And the first authentic translations of the Greek New Testament into any other language uh, were written in what we call Old Syriac, which they like to refer to as Aramaic, but Old Syriac is probably a more uh, accurate name for it. And uh, those manuscripts predate the ones the Catholic Church has been using for centuries. Uh, two primary Greek translations of the Old Testament called Vaticanus, or New Testament called Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Um, and thus, those are, the, those are seen or considered to be the oldest, the most reliable uh, Greek manuscripts uh, for the New Testament, which of course they're not. Uh, and the Syriac, or Syrian, um, translation of the Greek New Testament uh, predate the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus by, by at least 200 years. And uh, the readings in those Syriac manuscripts agree with the readings found in your King James Bible. Um, and the first off, well, I already said that. Here in Ezra 4 8, Ezra 4 8 through Ezra 6 18. Uh, was all written in Syriac. Even though they don't begin to quote the letter that they mailed, that they sent until verse 12, verse 8 says the Jews' antagonists wrote a letter against Jerusalem. The Bible calls Mount Zion the city of the great king, Psalm 48, 2. And um, Christ said, Swear not neither by heaven for his God's throne, neither by earth for it is his footstool, uh, nor by the earth, um, for it is the, or no, excuse me, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, there in Matthew 5, verse 35. Uh, the Bible says that God chose Jerusalem. Uh, run forward to the book of Psalms, Psalm 132. 
Psalm 132. And notice two verses there, verses 13 and 14. Psalm 132, verses 13 and 14. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. To uh, undertake to write a letter against Jerusalem, you are on dangerous ground with the God of the Bible. How do you think the United Nations fares in the eyes of God? Uh, they pass continual, continual resolutions against the state of Israel, against the actions of the state of Israel, against the, the political decisions of the state of Israel, against the government of the state of Israel, against the uh, expanding of their own uh, building uh, residences, building dwellings um, for their own citizens, where Muslims say, that's our land. It's not. It, what is what was recognized as the state of Israel and then uh, taken over by the Israelis in the 1967 war uh, is the state of Israel. And the, the Arabs and the Muslims living within that state have no legitimate claim to any of it. The Jews just keep conceding more and more land to these people, hoping they'll stop complaining, and that don't work. It just doesn't work. Um, the Bible says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Psalm 122, verse 6. Jeruz Jerusalem is only in temporary bondage right now, according to Galatians 4, and verse 25. And Paul contrasts that with Jerusalem, which is above, which is the mother of us all, is free. And um, New Jerusalem will be the capital of the universe one day. That will be where your dwelling, my dwelling, our mansions are situated. And, um, but uh, uh, Jerusalem on the earth, physical, earthly Jerusalem, is the capital of Abraham's descendants, and that is where Christ's throne will be uh, set up for a thousand years during his uh, reign here on the earth. And this letter that they mailed, or they keep sending mail, mail but um, this letter that they sent to the king of Persia um, was written against that city here on the earth. And there are at least three people who you could identify who hate Jerusalem and they despise it being the Jews' inheritance. One of those is mentioned here in verse 8. That'll be Shimshai the scribe, and before him, Rehum the chancellor. And thirdly, any Catholic pope you could name. They all despise Israel being given to the Jews as their exclusive inheritance. And um, they don't like it. Um, Dr. Ruckman wrote about this back in 2001 in a, one of his later books called Israel, a Deadly Piece of Dirt, about the continual warfare and fighting over Israel since the days of uh, Isaac and Ishmael, and who was the right, uh, rightful heir to Abraham. And he cites a statement, a statement by Pope John Paul II, that it was illegal and it was immoral for anyone to give Jerusalem exclusively to the Jews um, and he also cites statements by uh, Yasser Arafat, remember him, that it was um, he and the other Arabs' uh, uh, intention to send as many non-Jews, just insert the word Muslim, into Israel to sort of displace the population of uh, the Jewish people, if possible, and also, quote, to finish, or rather to complete, the work that Hitler began, unquote. And I think we, we have a little bookstore here, and we may sell his book, Israel, A Deadly Piece of Dirt, um, in our little bookstore. I don't have a, a key to it, so maybe check on Sunday, see if it's for sale. And, um, but it's this kind of displacement of the Jewish people that we mentioned briefly back in verse 1, 
<coughs> over chapter 4, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord, God of Israel, and so forth, match that with, with verse 10, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Asnapar brought over and set in the cities of Samaria and the rest there on this side of the river and at such a time. Asnapar was the king of Assyria and he's said to have been the only uh, Assyrian king who ever entered into uh, Shushan the palace, the capital of the Persian Empire in those days. Now, if he did, and the king of Persia was willing to authorize the Jews' rebuilding project, then it may explain a um, sort of a paradoxical verse. Turn a page to chapter 6, verse, chapter 6, verse 22. Well, verse 19, And the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the fourteenth day of the first month, verse 22, and kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful, notice, and turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Otherwise, the Assyrians were uh, longtime enemies of Israel, seeking to conquer other nations and expand their own uh, empire in those days. Go, if you will, back to 2 Kings 18. 2 Kings 18. <clears throat> and first of all, verse 1. Now it came to pass. By the way, the Assyrian Empire, the, the Assyrian capital, uh, was, well, it was, it was based, the capital was a town or a city in the, what we call the northern end of Iraq today. Of course, it's right along the Tigris River, uh, the city Asher, A-S-S-U-R, hence the name of the, the kingdom. But um, verse one, now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. There you see the, the distinction between the, the ten tribes to the north, called the king of Israel, and the two tribes to the south, called the king of Judah. And uh, you read the kings and the chronicles, and they mention in the days of this king, this other king began to reign in Judah, or Israel. Uh, vice versa. And then uh, verse 17, And the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. There's a something else that you shouldn't do. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the Fuller's Field, Verse 19, and Rab Shekah said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? And also, <coughs> verse 28, again, Then Rab Shekah stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language, and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. So there's no um, shortage of pride uh, in the king of Assyria. Here his representative speaks for him and uh, threatens the nation of Israel to submit. We're going to, you're going to be taken over, and your king Hezekiah, the nation of Judah rather, your king Hezekiah will have no power to deliver you. You might as well get ready for it because we're going to come and we're going to take over. And he refers to his master as the great king the king of Assyria. Um, and lastly, well, not, maybe not lastly, but go to Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. And we're going to be brief tonight. I rambled on quite a bit talking earlier. And hopefully we'll be able to cover the rest of this chapter 
uh, in one evening next time we meet. But Isaiah chapter 10, Isaiah 10, and uh, start there at verse 5. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge, to take the spoil, and to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. How be it, he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. For he saith, Are not my princes altogether kings? That is an anticipation of the Antichrist. And um, God uses him to bring judgment upon a disobedient and a rebellious people, Israel. Uh, just as he used, he used uh, uh, Egypt to humble and uh, judge the nation of uh, his people for 400 years, he used the Babylonians and King um, Nebuchadnezzar to judge the Jews uh, for 70 years. Uh, and he would bring in Philistines multiple times to wage war against Israel, to uh, defeat them and cause them to turn back to God once again. They get filled with pride. They reject the commandments of God. They reject the, the sacrifices of God at the, at the altar. And uh, their hearts filled with pride once again. They start embracing the gods of uh, gold and silver and carved images and the deities of the nations around them start to intermarry with the other nations and give their sons to their other nations' daughters and their daughters to their sons and so forth. And God has to humble them time and time again, and he uses other nations to do so. And then he holds that other nation, those other kings, responsible for the severity of their actions toward Israel. The idea that one guy can be the instrument of God to commit, or commit uh, uh, wrath and punishment on the Jewish people and go and get by with it un, unscathed, undisciplined, is false. He's going to have to answer for his role in uh, the way he treated the Jew. So it seems like God's, God's uh, using one to punish the other, and then he punishes the second one for the way he conducted himself. Yeah, that's exactly what he's doing. But it, it also over, it emphasizes the role of free will. Free will coupled with the intention of God to send judgment. And he would do this multiple times. And he'll do it again with the man of sin um, uh, during the tribulation. And also jump for the forward there in Isaiah 10, verses 23 and 24. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption, even determined in the midst of all the land. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. And of course, he'll be destroyed like Pharaoh in the, man, as in the manner of Egypt. But the, anti, the point I wanted to see is the Antichrist is going to be part uh, Assyrian and part Jew. And it will probably be that mixture of, of a, a lineage that helps him to um, a broker some peace agreement with Israel and the Arab nations around him. Um, go quickly, and the reason I say Assyrian, Assyrian and Jew, go to the book of Daniel, and we'll finish here in Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11. Daniel 11, start at verse 36. And the king, this will be the great king, as he was referred to by his representatives, the king of Assyria, the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, 
and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. So that's what also tells us that he will be Jewish as well as Gentile or Syrian. Nor the desire of women. A lot of debate as to what that phrase means, what that clause means. Either he's not interested in women because he's of the other persuasion, which is most likely. The Bible is very delicate in the way it uh, touches on that subject, but that's everywhere you look these days. Um, which, uh, to me, proved that Bill Clinton was never going to be the Antichrist. Uh, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and the God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. All that leads you right to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul's uh, description of the um, son of perdition, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, um, who set himself up above, um, set himself on the throne uh, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, and so on. And the way he's uh, uh, celebrated by a false church who prides herself on gold and silver and precious stones, someone will Someone representing, someone who claims, I should say, to represent Christ and his church will praise this man for finally brokering a peace deal between Israel and the poor Muslims, the poor Palestinians in that part of the world. And uh, they don't try to squeeze in there and, and uh, get credit for it. It seems to me, and... Um, We've talked about this before, but there is a lot of what is called Greek Orthodox or, or Eastern Orthodox um, Christianity. And there are a lot of oddball Americans who think somehow um, that ancient uh, form of worship, uh, Eastern Orthodox worship, that goes back centuries and centuries, long before we had our modern uh, version of churches and church worship, etc. Maybe they had something, maybe they're on to something. That simply is a, just a, another, it, it's like a uh, Roman Catholicism that's changed costumes for the next act. Uh, it's, it's about the same thing. You go to a Greek Orthodox Church or an Eastern Orthodox Church or Russian Orthodox Church, and um, they don't want to say that they made a bold stand when they broke from Catholicism a thousand years ago, about, about the year 1000. They had a break from Catholicism. They took a stand against the Pope's authority. And uh, one of the things that they, they brought up in dispute with each other was how to make the sign of the cross. The Catholic Church, the Catholics, they just kind of dip their finger in the holy water and their middle fingers make a sign of the cross with their Greek Orthodox they believe that you should use all three fingers, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, put them all three together and do it that way. That really makes a big difference in my mind. And uh, they would argue over things as, as trivial like that. Now they allow their, their priests to be uh, married and a few things that the Roman Catholic Church does not allow. But in every other respect, they are still in fellowship with the, with the Holy See of Rome and the, and the Pope um, and, and the Vatican. And uh, it's funny how all these Protestant churches or sort of splintered off churches all want to go back and be in good fellowship with the Pope. Somehow we're not gaining worldwide uh, following doing it our way. We should go back to uh, Roman Catholicism, a worldwide church, and we'll be welcomed in by the Pope. And see, these Popes, every few years, they have some big meeting at the Vatican, a religious dialogue, and on the stage, there'll be, there'll be the, the um, Archbishop of Canterbury, there'll be a, some Russian uh, patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church, as well as the Pope. You'll have the Dalai Lama of the Tibetan Buddhist. You'll have uh, some guy who's a, a shaman of American Indian religion there. And you'll have other people from other strange beliefs there. They're all there to uh, cozy up to the Roman Catholic Pope 
because they all recognize he's got greater authority than any of them combined. You all want to be friends with him. You might as well just embrace the devil and give him a right, nice, big hug. All it's going to do for you. And, um, but it seems that the, Catholic, the, the Antichrist will be someone who belongs to the Catholic Church uh, or holds the equivalent title of Pope uh, in an effort to uh, unite all religions <clears throat> as well as having a physical lineage of uh, Syr Assyrian and Jew. And other, uh, several other descriptions given to us uh, little by little in the Bible. That's probably worth um, a specific Bible study in the near future, the uh, characteristics of the Antichrist, and uh, identify a number of them. It'd be worth doing sometime in the near future.